I moved from San Francisco to Raleigh to come work at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And they were already a wonderful uh, institution that uh, added a new wing called the Nature Research Center that had f has four labs with glass walls so you can see the research. We already had researchers, but they're hidden. You know, in most museums, they're hidden away in the dungeons. So okay, at, so at our new facility... In, in your museum, the researchers were dioramas. <laughs> the researchers are... They're, they're better than dioramas. They're beyond animatronic Lincolns. They are actual living, breathing, uh, publishing researchers. Mm -hmm. And so we have... Um, a biodiversity lab, a paleontology lab, a genomics lab, and similarly, what was new was the astronomy lab. There are now two astronomers uh, on staff and their and grad students uh, that come along. So, yeah, people, uh, yeah, I mean, how many people have ever seen an, a scientist at work? Yeah, you never do. You see them talking about work that they've completed. Uh, maybe there's a documentary where they're mixing chemicals, but the day to day, no, you don't. You don't get to see that. So that um, I applaud. Your institution's goals yeah. there, and so similarly, I guess let's 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 bring this around to um, the thing that's uh, that that really caused me to to reach out to you for this interview, um, Cosmos. Um, there might be something analogous here in that the role of a museum. What's the role of a museum, and what's the role of a science television show? Um, and I know you have some thoughts on this, that, that Cosmos, for instance, is not intended to just bring us up to speed on the science that has advanced in the past 30 years. Correct. It has a much different. So what is the purpose of Cosmos, and, and what's the purpose of a museum, since that's a big part of your work as well, museum Actually, artists. I see them as very, very related phenomena. So one of my, the things I lament is the extent to which sort of professional educators have gained access to museum exhibitry because they come in with a very different goal than, than I would, for example. When I say professional educators, I'm talking about the people who got PhDs and they are experts in how you learn and the cognitive difference between a ninth grader and a twelfth grader and a sixth grader and a, so they they understand all that and, and kudos to them for doing so but you go into a museum and they will judge an exhibit based on well, how long it keeps you all right because if it's boring you just move on and what concept it's being tested and whether you have learned that concept by the time you're done and then they give you a little quiz at the end and that then they'll assess what you learned on the, on, and, okay, you could make a museum like that, but that's not the museum I would design. I would design a museum where you don't learn a thing. <laughs> 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 I would design a museum, uh, yes, you would learn something. I, In I, fact, I'm you, would lose, you would lose knowledge you through the learn. experience. <laughs> <laughs> I, I exaggerate. I want to design a museum where you were moved by what you saw where you were inspired by what you experienced, where you were compelled upon engaging that exhibit to go buy a book, to rent videos, to ask questions, to call up experts. You spend your first, you know, 16 years of your life in school, if you're a college graduate, and three hours in a museum <laughs> and you want to put a lesson plan in the one exhibit that has a few minutes of your attention over the three hours how realistic is that and judge the failure of that experience by because you didn't learn something so so i did a little experiment you you're a man about the town <laughs> um i have you been to the uh, chicago museum of science and industry I grew up in Chicago, so I haven't been in years, but that's the museum that okay. uh, I grew up with. Okay, what is the with. number one most memorable exhibit in that museum? Oh. Wait, 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 wait. I'm going to write it down. <laughs> did, did, did I mention that this was 40 years ago or so? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Um, yep, that pen doesn't work. Hang on. Okay, go. I, most memorable exhibit. I, I, it was probably the bathroom. That's not what I wrote down. 
I'm not sure. I know there were, it was big mechanical stuff, though. It was big. Um, yeah, I can't give you a specific. Too too many years have passed. What do you got there? Up, oh, bring it a coal mine. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Well, the coal mine they they just they put you in a cage and they bring you into a into a mock up of a coal mine. The reason why people remember that and the reason why you're remembering big machines is because people remember exhibits bigger than they are. Yeah. <laughs> exhibits where they're immersed. Not ex an exhibit you walk up to and push a button and pull a lever. Yeah. Exhibits where you have to do this. That's what people remember. Whether or not there's any lesson plan that came out of it. If you do the same exercise for the Franklin Museum in Philadelphia, okay, have you ever been there? I haven't. Okay. I, some of your viewers will have. So the I will write down, okay, give them a second to think, okay? What's the most memorable exhibit? At the Franklin Museum. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Do they, do they have, have they answered? <laughs> they can pause the video okay. and think this about it. This will be the answer <laughs> of 100% of them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, little, uh, it's overexposed. Bring it closer or, oh, heart. The heart? Yes, there's a huge mechanical heart that you walk Ooh. through, and they've got these subwoofers going, boom, boom, <laughs> boom, boom, and you're moving through the aorta. And it's one of like, once again, it's one of these, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. And and so, at at our museum in New York, at the American Museum of Natural History, we took that to heart because I was head of stuff, so I could I had power to influence. Um, some of the ideas that the exhibit designers were coming up with and the like. And, but our greatest immersive experience is, of course, the planetarium. Yeah. <laughs> and that's everyone's first virtual reality experience. And that's why it has such an impact on people. And you'll remember not what you learned. You'll remember being there. Right. So, as you said, this isn't that you have people for a short period of time. It's not the right. time to try to give them a lifetime's education. But you could give them enough inspiration to then for a lifetime, yeah. To be self-driven, to then go learn. And you because know this no firsthand because that's the actual place where you were inspired. No, but, well, yes, I was, yes. But no one becomes great at anything only by ever having been taught. The greatest of people in whatever they do had the motivation, perhaps inspired by an influential teacher or experience, but at the end of the day, they were self-motivated. And so that their interstitial moments in their day, they were thinking about this new idea that, uh, that, that stimulated them. So Cosmos, the show, we've got you for 13 broadcast hours. So it's 42 minutes an hour. So it's really nine total hours of television because it's on broadcast TV with commercials. But I've got you for nine hours. And uh, the script, written by Andrian, who's co-writer of the original script, she, she feels the universe. So there are words in there where you, you're feeling it, all right? And we layer into those feelings the science, the science that matters for who and what you are in this universe, not the science that we just tore from a textbook and say, here's the latest and here's the... No, it's, we, we cherry-pick this. Find the topics... That'll make you feel the universe just the way Anne feels the universe. And the goal is to inspire you not only to embrace science and all that it is, but to take the messages of science and become better, better shepherds of our civilization, better shepherds of the earth. And so that's how we see the, the scientific enlightenment uh, going forward. Right. And there's an emphasis on storytelling, which I applaud. Yeah, thanks for yes. bringing that up. I, I, I can tell some stories, but <laughs> Anne is a better storyteller. And she, so there are stories of people who came before us. Um, some historical stories were, were exhumed from the books. People you might not have heard of, but were significant in ways and you ought to, should know about them. Uh, Steve Soder is a colleague of mine. One of my 10 books is is uh, we were co-editors of a volume. He actually did most of the work in that, and I, I felt bad because I was... Uh, but anyhow, yeah. uh, it's just my confession. <laughs> it's Soder and Tyson. It's real. If you could have, give ratios of right. proportions... <laughs> a you pie know, chart? <laughs> <you know. laughs> 
Yeah, pie, a pie chart, right? <laughs> yeah, so, authors. <laughs> that would just be more accurate, right? Yeah. But, but anyhow, we um, – uh, many of the people contribute to that who contribute – it was a, it was an anthology of contributors, and we were editors, and many of the people were people I knew. So that, that's where I, I contributed to it. But he really put in the – put in the um, he put in the hours, but but anyhow, he's co-writer of the original series, as well as the current one, and so so he will he finds these people no one's ever heard of, because he's also quite a historian of science, and you tell the stories, and we, a point that Anne likes to make, and I agree entirely with that, we are a story-driven species. Yes, we love stories, from childhood. You sit on the rug, and someone is there, just compellingly telling you about the king or the princess or the voyage or the monsters or the the heroes and uh, we don't quite have monsters in this but we do have <laughs> heroes 